Hi, I'm Yana, and I knew that I wanted to become a doctor when I killed a patient and then a minute later saved her life. The Harvard Medical School Med Science program is a high school biology course that immerses students into simulated medical emergencies. It is the anatomy and physiology class that I took recently during my senior year. And during one of our patient simulations, a woman came in who was suffering from a heart attack. I look over at her monitor and I see that her heart rate and her respiratory rate are skyrocketing while her blood pressure and her oxygen levels are absurdly low. She was complaining that she felt like she couldn't breathe and that her chest hurt, which are two major signs of a heart attack. My 11 other classmates are in this tiny room with me, yelling at me to get an inhaler and to use it so that I could help her breathe. My coaches are also pressuring me to do the same exact thing and I'm standing here and I'm thinking to myself, is an inhaler even gonna help her in this situation? Just to be clear, we did not know that this woman was having a heart attack. And my classmates are on one side of the bed and then another one. And then my coaches are at the foot of the bed and I'm on this side of the bed. And one of my coaches comes up to me and she says to me sternly, and I mean sternly, Yana, you are not giving your patient the proper care. Give her the inhaler. She didn't say that to me verbatim, but you get the gist of the situation that I was in. I was taught to never crumble under social pressure, but in this moment I did. I administered the albuterol, which is the stuff that's inside an inhaler. The patient took a breath in and then held, and then another breath, and then she died right away. For the first time in my life, I had heard that awful, beep and i look over at the monitor and i just see that little red flat line make its way across the screen and i was on autopilot my body was moving faster than my thoughts were and before we could even get the bed down flat i was already doing compressions to keep her alive i was going and going and counting the 30. my coaches are telling me to keep my arms straight and to not crack a rib while my classmates are singing staying alive completely offbeat to my rhythm and I'm just I'm going and I'm going and I'm going and I'm doing the compressions and I had to get the stool that was underneath the hospital bed so I'm like trying to do compressions and get this stool with my foot and so I'm like one two three four god five six seven please be alive so I can get an A in this class all of a sudden the patient gasps she wakes up she's alive I was so relieved I stepped off of the stool and I looked at the patient and I looked at her monitor and her vitals were great. And I realized in that moment in time, I just saved a life. That's crazy. By the way, this was not a real human. This was a robotic dummy. However, I am still on the fence about checking the box next to pre-med when it comes to my undergraduate degree. And it's not what you're all thinking. It's not because the MCATs are hard. It's not because medical school is tough and grueling. It's not because being a woman in STEM is highly competitive. And honestly, it's not even because I hate needles. The thing that concerns me the most about being in medical school is that I would be sitting in a class that would most likely be taught by a white man who would tell me that Black people feel less pain than white people. And that black people have thicker skin compared to white people. When a black woman gets rushed to the ER because she's in labor, I would be instructed to give her less epidural than her white counterpart. Giving birth is painful. I mean, I don't know how painful it can be. And at this point in my life, I really don't wanna know. But how am I supposed to help appease and possibly save a patient's life when I can't even give her the correct amount of medication solely based on her race? How am I supposed to save a life when I'm taught through a lens of racial bias? Doctors are not only healers, they are scientists. They have taken countless classes in chemistry and biology and are constantly looking for new ways to take care of patients. One of the first things that they learn 
and that I learned in my anatomy and physiology class is that the body is an organism and there are six levels that make up that organism. Level one, anatomical. We're all made of atoms. Level two, cellular or molecular. These terms are used interchangeably. They mean exactly the same thing. Everything in our body is made of cells. Our bones, our skin, our hair, our blood, sweat, and tears, it's all made of cells. Level three, tissues. Our bodies are connected by various amounts of tissues. Level four, organs. We need our organs to function. If we didn't have a stomach, we couldn't function. If we didn't have a brain, we could not function. Level five, organ systems. Each organ is part of a system and there are 11 systems in total. For example, the stomach is part of the digestive system. And then finally, level six, the organism, the body itself. Every doctor takes this piece of information with them with every single patient that they see. There is a reason as to why in a patient chart, there's a section called labs. Doctors might need to take a urine sample or a blood sample in order to see what's going on with the cells. Doctors need to know what's going on inside your body from the tiny little cells to just hearing your heartbeat with a stethoscope. A study that was done in 2016 by the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America gathered 418 medical students and professionals. They gave them a survey which asked questions like, do you believe that black people and white people are different on a genetic biophysical level? Or do you believe that black people feel less pain than white people and other biologically false and racist statements similar to those? Researchers found that 12% of the group believed that one or more of the questions or statements that they were asked was true. 50% of the group, that's five zero, believed that at least one of the questions or statements that they were asked was true. Another study showed that doctors sometimes have unconscious bias when it comes to taking care of black patients, whether that be giving them less attention to treating them completely differently, the problem still exists. Even back in the 1960s, two very important laws were passed, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. While this meant that the refusal of service was illegal, it doesn't mean that unequal treatment stopped as well. Due to this, there is a huge health crisis in the United States that affects black people at a disproportionate rate compared to white people. The number one cause of death in the United States is heart disease. This includes heart attacks and strokes, as well as long-term heart issues like coronary artery disease and hypertension, which can lead to death if not taken care of properly. In 2019, the CDC found that 47% of Americans suffer from hypertension, which means chronic high blood pressure. Just to put it into perspective, the average blood pressure that a human should have should be 120 over 80 millimeters per mercury. And when someone suffers from hypertension, their blood pressure is 140 or more over 90 or more millimeters per mercury. Hypertension is caused by a high salt diet, high fat diet, little exercise, smoking, high stress, and can also be genetic. Blood pressure is related to heart issues because our blood vessels pump blood throughout our whole entire body. And that blood is coming from our heart. Our blood pressure is like a garden hose. Let's say in this case, the garden hose is the blood vessels and the blood vessels walls. And the water is our blood. When you turn on the water, it's just gonna come normally out of the hose. You can water your hydrangeas and your tulips and whatever makes you happy. Now, let's say that there's dirt and grime inside of the water hose. When we go to turn on the water, it's still gonna come out, but not as smoothly as before. Our blood vessels have walls. The narrower these walls get, the less space that blood has to move, which means that the pressure gets higher. Hypertension can cause blood clots due to the narrowing of these, due to the narrowing of the blood vessels walls. Plaque, that dirt and grime that I was talking about, can break off and cut off blood supply. Meaning one of two things is gonna happen, a heart attack or a stroke. 
Nearly half of America suffers from hypertension. Of that 47%, the CDC found that hypertension is more common specifically in black adults. 56% of black adults. 48% of white adults suffer from hypertension. 32% of white adults take medication for hypertension, while only 25% of black adults take medication for hypertension. Statistics are only numbers and, present and percentages that have absolutely no explanation for the real issue at hand. When soldiers came back from World War II, they wanted to come back to peace, hence the reasoning for suburbs. Many houses in a segregated area that were white only due to the high demand for a suburbia, the American dream, if you will, you know, white picket fence, smiling white family, mom, dad, older brother, younger sister, you get the picture. Now, it's not only about the fact that black people were forced into lower income urban communities, that black people were forced into lower income urban communities with little to no access to hospitals, banks, and grocery stores, but it is also the fact that while these new suburbs were being built, new hospitals, grocery stores, and banks were being, around, were being built around them as well. There are areas in the Bronx that are food deserts that, ha that have literally no proper grocery store, whereas in Manhattan, there are endless options to find your groceries. What I'm referring to is redlining, basically the birth of gentrification in this country. And the reason as to why it's called redlining is because black populated areas are circled with a red line on a map and it still exists today. Since black people were forced into environments with foods that are high in fat and salt, with little to no access to hospitals, with little to no access to banks to pay for the hospital visit, have been in high stress situations due to the aggressive racism of this country, and on top of that have experienced medical mistrust due to things like vaccine trials and forced sterilizations, the statistics make more sense. I know that we can bring that 56% down significantly, but I also have to mention that when it comes to race and health sciences, we need to make a clear distinction here. The only scientific aspect about this issue is the mechanics of heart disease and genetics, not race. The racial aspect comes in when we start talking about things like redlining systemic and systematic racism. Like I said, we need to make that distinction clear. I know that we can bring that 56% down significantly. When it comes to patients who suffer from chronic diseases, it always starts with the patient's history. There's a section in the patient chart that is dedicated to the patient's history. This includes family history, medical history, surgical history, and daily habits that encompass social history. This part of the chart can sometimes be overlooked, but if we used epigenetics in this part of the chart specifically for chronic, specifically for patients who suffer from chronic diseases, then it would help our doctors a lot. Doctors know that DNA is in every single one of our cells and that it's in our blood. If doctors took a blood sample, specifically for patients with chronic heart diseases, and took a look at the genetics in the blood that can code for chronic heart diseases, and then if they took a look at the patient's history and their diet, then we could help people based on their own DNA. Doctors have found a family of genes that can code for heart disease. Specifically, the gene MEF2A, which is part of the which is part of the MEF2 family, can code for a heart disease, coronary artery disease, and a heart attack. Epigenetics is a fairly new science that has only been discovered in the past two to three decades. Epigenetics is a study of how certain genes genes that are in the genome can change can either be turned on or turned off due to the environment that a person is in. Environment is a umbrella term that refers to the physical and psychological environment that somebody either lives in or grew up in. Basically, epigenetics can add a chemical group or 
change the uh, methyl group that adds a chemical cap to the DNA molecule that either turns on a gene to be expressed or turns it off. A methyl group, a methyl group is like a flag that signals the machinery in the cell that either activates that either activates the gene to be expressed or turns it off. Like I said, these genes are already in the genome, but epigenetics helps us find the reason as to why they are turned on or turned off. It is also important to note that a product of a gene is a protein, and that protein plays a very important role in running our bodies. For example, in our blood, there is this protein called hemoglobin that helps transport oxygen through the blood. There are many examples of epigenetics that range from trauma to diseases. A good example of epigenetics is smokers versus non-smokers. Someone who smokes has made an epigenetic change in their life. A specific gene called the AHRR gene has less of this methylation or addition of a chemical group added to the DNA molecule. Scientists have found that if one were to quit smoking, the methylation increases. The less someone smokes, the more this gene is expressed. The more someone smokes, the less this gene is expressed. That's the point of epigenetics. Our genetics are either turned on or turned off due to our environment. Someone can just go to their doctor and give a blood sample, let's say every four months. We target these genes and to see if the protein from these genes is still being expressed. This will make our patient care better because it is personalized to us and to our DNA and to our bodies. On top of that, if we taught our med students how to read a genetic code, how to find these genes, then there is more that they could do other than just offer surgery or prescribe pills. It is also important to note that traumatic experiences can manifest as epigenetic changes. These changes can be passed down to multiple generations. The way that the medical system has treated the black community should not be forgotten or swept under the rug. If this plan were to work, it would give more attention to black patients who are suffering from hypertension at a higher rate than white patients are. On top of that, it's a way easier and less invasive way to truly see a change in someone's health. It's about decreasing the disease. It's about decreasing the 56%. And it is about giving our patients our undivided attention and time. And it's also about diminishing the racial bias in medicine. But like anything in science and medicine, in order to see a true change, it takes time and effort. Any doctor or nurse will tell you that healing is the longest and hardest part of recovery. Generational trauma will not end in the bat of an eye. Epigenetics will not just all of a sudden be part of the patient chart agenda. And scientific racism in medicine will not just vanish into thin air because of this one solution that I'm proposing. I could have stood here and talked about the multitude of diseases and medical discoveries that have affected the black community negatively. That's the raw reality. Rome wasn't built in a day. But I know that with hard work, patience, and proper information and communication about what is going on with someone's health, we can change the narrative. Thank you.